Just before the video begins, please subscribe and like the videos to help the channel grow. Also, leave a comment, good, bad, or indifferent. Thanks for watching. The fact that this was known and the fact that you were the Beatles might have caused thousands of kids to go into drug problems that might not have otherwise. Uh, well, no, no. Let him Shut ask up, the question. Let him ask the question. Uh, when we took the notorious wonder drug LSD, yeah. uh, we didn't know we were having it. John and I had, the, had this drug. We were at, having dinner with our dentist. Yeah. So we had it and we went out to a club and it was incredible. It was really incredible. <laughs> During the summer of 1967, George Harrison was going through a period of sobriety. He'd often get in too deep with substances before pulling back and attempting a clean lifestyle. At this time, he and his wife Patty Boyd, a model he'd met when filming A Hard Day's Night, were eagerly awaiting a trip to Haight-Ashbury. Paul McCartney had just returned from his trip to San Francisco with wondrous tales of the hippie movement. To George, this sounded like heaven on earth. On August 1st, George and Patty flew over on a private Learjet to see for themselves. When they arrived in San Francisco, they climbed into the back of a rented limousine where George swallowed a tab of acid. His short period of sobriety had come to an end. The pair, accompanied by friends, headed off to see the magical Haight-Ashbury. George later stated, when he arrived, he expected the people at Haight to be all nice, friendly, clean and happy. As the limo approached, what George saw through the tinted windows was a depressed slum with teenagers begging, selling incense, barefoot, unwashed and stoned out of their minds. The limousine stopped not far from the famous Haight-Ashbury intersection and George and his crew climbed out. As he walked through the street he encountered a Hells Angel wearing a sleeveless denim jacket. High on acid, his burly build was exaggerated and he seemed gigantic. George felt very intimidated but a wave of relief washed over him when the angel made it clear he just wanted to shake the hand of his idol. So relieved was George in fact, he invited the man to London. Come visit us sometime, he stated, we'll put you up. It was an offer he'd lived to regret. George and Patty wandered past the dingy psychedelic shops, selling tatty second-hand clothes and headed into Golden Gate Park. The park was rammed with teenagers and in just a short period of time, George and Patty were surrounded. From out the crowd, a guitar was thrust into George's hands. No, no, please, stammered George. A voice from the crowd shouted, play. This now instigated a chant of play, play, play from the stone crowd. In a state of disorientation, George began to strum a few chords. The song he attempted was Baby You're a Rich Man, which was currently in the charts. But under the influence of acid, the cheap guitar felt like a lump of cheese in his hands. George quickly handed back the guitar, apologising profusely and carried on walking. At this point the crowd turned slightly hostile, the rejection from their hero had lowered the mood. By the time they reached their limousine they were practically running and threw themselves inside. The mob surrounded the car shouting and rocking it from side to side. The driver pulled away slowly through the sea of disgruntled youths. When George returned to England he was so disgusted by the ordeal he swore he'd never take another drug again. This was a promise he would not keep. When he next saw John Lennon he told him of his new plan of sobriety, to which John shrugged, saying, Well, it's not doing me any harm, so I'll just keep on with it for a while. <laughs> 
By the time George was 14, he was already a guitar fanatic. He brought his first guitar from another boy in school at the cost of £3. His next guitar was a deluxe model paid for by doing chores for the local butcher on Saturdays. When George met John and Paul, his guitar playing was quite impressive, especially for a boy of his age. Paul had once been the lead guitarist of the group, but he froze once during a solo and would thereon switch to rhythm, eventually ending up on bass. When the Beatles were due to make their first American TV performance on the Ed Sullivan Show, George had come down with the flu. He had a high temperature and the doctors confined him to his room. Word got around about George's illness, but this appearance was so important, short of death, nothing would stop George from playing that night. According to Neil Aspinall, the doctor visited George the day of the appearance, and shot him up with a big dose of amphetamines. The other Beatles were taking the same orally. George was loaded into a limo, drove to the studio, and the performance couldn't have gone any better. When shooting for the Beatles' first film, A Hard Day's Night, George was nonplussed to say the least. He came across as bored or disinterested while in front of the camera. Though he took nothing from the movie experience, he did meet his first wife, Patty Boyd, on set. She was an extra on the film and was surprised to find the Beatles were down to earth and friendly. A year later, shooting for the Beatles' second film, Help, began. Again, George didn't have much interest in broadcasting his acting ability and again, he walked away from the experience with a new love. A scene in which a group of Indians were trying to pick out Beatles songs on their instruments meant a sitar would be required on set. George was fascinated with the instrument and sent his assistant to a nearby music shop to buy one. The only problem was he didn't know how to play, so George began taking music lessons. In 1965, George's song Taxman was a huge success in the US. That, along with two of his other songs, featured on the Beatles' latest album, Revolver. Soon after this, on the suggestion of his new friend Ravi Shankar, George grew a moustache and shortened his hair. Filming for the Beatles' third film began in September 1967. The film had no script, no storyline, and featured the Beatles on a road odyssey aboard a coach. The majority of the ideas for the film had come from Paul. It aired at Christmas and was ripped apart by critics. The Beatles' next film would be an animated fantasy titled Yellow Submarine. The soundtrack was recorded in bits and pieces and George never considered it a serious creative project. To him, it was just work. He did, however, get a kick of seeing himself animated on the big screen. On December 4th, 1968, George Harrison sent a memo to the Apple staff that read, Hell's Angels will be in London within the next week. There will be 12 in number, complete with black leather jackets and motorcycles. They will undoubtedly arrive at Apple, and I've heard they may try to make full use of Apple's facilities. They may look as though they are going to do you in, but they are very straight and do good things. Try to assist without neglecting your Apple business and without letting them take control of Savile Row. The angel George had met for all of two minutes at Haight-Ashbury was taking him up on his word. The man was known as Frisco Pete and along with another angel named Billy Tumbleweed travelled to London with an entourage of stoned, long-haired hippies. The arrival of this entourage stopped all activity dead at Savile Row. The record label arranged for a huge Christmas dinner for the gang and ordered a £43 turkey. This was at the time the largest you could buy in Britain. The gang got restless waiting for the food to be served and a brawl broke out. Some of the Beatles were at Apple that day but George Harrison, presuming there would be trouble, did not attend the meal. After this debacle, they were asked to leave, but refused unless George told them they had to go.
George drove down to Apple and told them in a subtle way to leave and the gang gathered their things and left Savile Row. George had recently bought an enormous mansion called Friar Park that was in terrible disrepair. There were friars' heads carved everywhere on doors and light switches. The rooms were gigantic ballrooms and the bathrooms were as big as a London flat. Man-made lakes featured on the grounds and contained 40,000 different varieties of flowers and leaves. A full-time gardener had to be employed to take care of them. George invited a 77-year-old guru to live in a small house on the grounds along with several monks. At dawn, George awoke, bathed in ice-cold water, spent hours walking through the grounds and examined the trees and plants. His wife Patty was eager to start a family. George at this point was the only beetle who had not become a father. Patty wanted to adopt children and due to George's refusal, the pair had heated arguments. George would later father a son named Danny with his second wife. Patty, to this day, is still childless. At this point, Patty had begun a close friendship with Eric Clapton and it was obvious to anyone around them that he was madly in love with her. Patty attended a party a music producer was throwing and Eric Clapton was also in attendance. Later that night at the party, George appeared and searched for Patty. He was about to leave when he spotted her in the garden with Eric. He approached the pair and said, What's going on? To Patty's horror, Eric replied, I have to tell you man, I'm in love with your wife. George was furious. He turned to Patty and said, Well, are you going with him or coming with me? Patty left the party with George and the two went back to Friar Park. When they arrived home, Patty went to bed and George headed into his recording studio. In the following weeks, Eric contacted Patty and asked her to go away with him on holiday. When she refused, he took out a small packet he had in his pocket and said, Well, if you're not going to come with me, I'm going to take this. Patty asked what it was and Eric replied, Heroin. Don't be stupid, Patty snapped and tried to grab it from his hands, but Eric had clenched his fist and put it back into his pocket. If you're not going to come with me, then that's it, I'm off, and he stormed off. As he'd threatened, Eric took the heroin and quickly became addicted. After that he completely withdrew, didn't leave the house, didn't see his friends, and didn't answer the phone. Patty meanwhile turned her attention to restoring Friar Park with George. She would see little of Eric for the next three years. Patty put her energies into becoming a passionate cook, which was challenging as the pair followed a strict vegetarian diet. George didn't like going out so he stayed in Friar Park. The house and garden had become an obsession and he wanted to do it alone. In the summer of 1971, George organised a charity affair to raise funds for the people of Pakistan. It would become known as the Concert for Bangladesh. John Lennon accepted an invitation to play, but on the morning of the concert, he had a furious row with Yoko. When he spoke to George, he was infuriated to learn that Yoko was not allowed to be on stage when they were playing. John was so angry, he took the next flight back to London. One night in 1973, Ringo, his wife Maureen, George and his wife Patty were together at John's house. From nowhere George blurted out, I'm in love with Maureen. Ringo stormed out and Patty burst into tears and locked herself in the bathroom. Soon after, Patty began to model again and at the same time, Eric Clapton had beaten his long addiction to heroin. George and Patty's marriage ended and Patty joined Eric on his tour of the US. Eric had switched his heroin addiction to an alcohol addiction and while on tour he was so drunk he played some shows flat on his back. George's own drinking increased and his next album Dark Horse 
and the subsequent tour were both disastrous. 1974 was the year George would meet his second wife Olivia. George, now in his mid-thirties, became more and more reclusive, rarely doing interviews and public appearances were few and far between. George's drinking was at an all-time high. One day he woke up, looked in the mirror and saw that his eyes had turned yellow. At this time, he'd also lost a considerable amount of weight. Olivia urged him to see a doctor. George refused, instead believing prayer was the answer. He began chanting a series of mantras designed to restore health. As the days went by and George was getting no better, he finally decided to see a doctor. His doctor told George he'd severely damaged his liver and had hepatitis. This frightened George so much he immediately quit drugs and alcohol. George made a full recovery and was looking healthier than he had in years, but it wasn't long before he was smoking, drinking and using drugs again, though the latter two apparently in moderation. He became friends with the local pub owners and the regulars who drank there and it wasn't uncommon for him to pick up the tab for the whole bar. On May 1978, George's dad, Harold Harrison, died at the age of 65. A lifetime of smoking had finally caught up with him. As George had done for his mother, he sat by his bed chanting and wishing him a safe journey to God. This same year, George's first and only child was born, and in preparation, George rushed out and brought a brand new Rolls Royce so that his wife and son would not be bounced around on the journey back from the hospital. On the 9th of December 1980, George was awakened by the phone ringing. He knew something was off and felt a sense of dread when he picked up the phone. His aunt informed him John Lennon had been shot and killed by an obsessed fan. George was distraught and broke down in tears. The phone rang again and a former Beatles publicist told George it was probably best to release a public statement so he could avoid being hounded by the press and grieve in peace. George responded, I can't now, maybe later, and then hung up the phone. When the publicist called back and insisted George make a statement, George agreed and they wrote down what would later appear in all the tabloids across the world. It read, After all we went through together, I had and still have a great love and respect for John Lennon. I am shocked and stunned. To rob life is the ultimate robbery in life. It is an outrage that people can take other people's lives when they obviously haven't got their own lives in order. Later that night, George was overcome with terror and panic. He started to believe John's death was only the beginning and the surviving Beatles would soon be next. George ordered his groundskeeper to go into the shed and take out all the chain that was there. The groundskeeper then headed to the front of the property, slammed shut the iron gates and wrapped the chain around them. To add to George's nerves, a crowd of Beatles fans had gathered in front of the property. The police were called and the crowd moved on. By 1983, George again began using drugs heavily, cocaine in particular. He was now in his 40s, but had the appearance of a man much older. Frustrated with the inaccuracies that had been told in countless books over the years, the surviving Beatles decided to get together and make a mammoth documentary titled The Beatles Anthology. At the time, it was reported that George was anxious to make the anthology as he was close to bankruptcy. George dismissed these claims as total rubbish. To promote the documentary, the three Beatles released a new single, Free As A Bird, using John's vocals from a demo tape. In the studio, John's absence made them feel weird, and as ever, with George and Paul back in the studio, disagreements soon began. George didn't like some of McCartney's idea for the songs, and after they completed their second single, Real Love, the band once again went their separate ways. In July 1997, while gardening, George felt a lump on the back of his neck. 
Fearing the worst, he checked himself into the hospital. He was diagnosed with early stage lung cancer and both the lump and part of his lung were surgically removed. The doctors believed they'd caught it in time and for now, George continued as normal. During the 90s, George and Olivia had numerous death threats sent to them along with breaking attempts that had been stopped. George spent millions on security cameras, floodlights, even guard dogs with handlers, but his insistence on a natural look to the property meant underground passages and caves were constructed, each unmanned, making it easy for any intruder to access the property. At 4.30am on the morning of December 30th, George and Olivia awoke to the sound of breaking glass. Somebody had entered their house. Olivia rushed to the bedroom door and locked it. George ran down the stairs to be confronted by 34-year-old Michael Abram, a former heroin addict and mental patient who was convinced the Beatles were witches. Abram lunged at George with a knife and the seven inch blade went straight through George's chest, just missing his heart, but puncturing his lung. George tackled Abram and the pair wrestled while George's blood splattered the walls. Olivia hearing the commotion rushed out and grabbed a fire poker. She hit Abram on the head as hard and as many times as she could. By this time a servant had awoken from the sounds of the scuffle and phoned the police. The man was apprehended and George once again narrowly avoided death. By November 2001 George's health had took a turn for the worse. The cancer had returned and was ravaging his body. He was admitted to hospital where Paul McCartney visited him. They spoke for six hours, Paul breaking down in tears as they talked about the past, their feuds, and no doubt about John. Even though death was near, George was in good spirits. George passed away November 29th, 2001. His ashes were dissolved in the Ganges River in India in accordance with his Hindu beliefs. This would allow for his soul to be separated from his body and avoid the circle of reincarnation so he would be sent straight to heaven. <laughs>